Uh, hello, everybody. So first of all, I would like to thank John, more particularly, uh, for uh, this invitation and this opportunity to talk here, which uh, I love. Bristol It's a very nice city, and I love this place as well. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about spectrally resolved white light bond interferometry for uh, optical material characterizations or specific parameters. And uh, today, I will focus my uh, uh, my interest on uh, chromatic dispersion in optical fibers. So this uh, work has been uh, carried out in the newly established Institute of Physics in Nice. As you can see, we have a very uh, interesting uh, acronym, INFINI, which is uh, not so bad, by the way, at the University of Nice uh, and the CNRS, which is, uh, this institute is a member of the newly established University of Excellence, University Côte d'Azur. So here's the outline of my talk. First, I will uh, briefly go back to the Heisenberg limit and uh, try to focus on the differences that we can have between classical and quantum states. Then I will uh, recall you about what is uh, spectrally resolved white light interferometry, so classical, uh, with uh, single photons and uh, the various applications that uh, this uh, type of system answer. Um, then I will go to the spectrally resolved white light quantum interferometry where we exploit two photon null states that are also at the same time energy time entangled. Then I will show the results that we have uh, obtained so far on chromatic dispersion measurements and I will uh, uh, describe a comparison between uh, the best classical measurements that we have done as well uh, for comparison and the quantum uh, uh, system that we have employed. Okay, so what's up from the Heisenberg side? So we all know that the Heisenberg limit for phase estimation is given by uh, this inequality, where you have the uncertainties on the photon number and the fate, which has to be, uh, the product has to be greater or equal to one. So if you exploit uh, coherent states of light, such, the, such as the ones that you can have from lasers, standard lasers, uh, the delta n is only given by the square root of n, such that you can have uh, an uncertainty on the phase uh, estimation that you want to do, uh, which is equal to 1 over square root of n. So the solution, uh, intuitively, would be to use uh, four states of light, or moon states, or whatever you want, uh, for having a delta n, which would be equal to n, and have a better phase estimation on its uncertainty. The problem is that you have to have n, and therefore delta n, as large as possible. And this is uh, the tricky part of the question. So a uh, quantum state can for sure answer these questions, those questions, but um, if you go to small, small number of photons involved in your quantum system, for sure that you have to find additional advantages for having uh, better estimations and uh, better results. And this is what I will try to show you today. So, spectrally resolve white light interferometry. Basically, you have such type of setup. Uh, you have a white light source that is injected into a Maxender or any other type, but Maxender here interferometer. So, you have a first beam splitter. You have, uh, for instance, if you want to make uh, optical characterization of optical fibers, you have a fiber on the test and you have a reference arm here. At the output, you will recombine the two signals in both arms uh, through a second beam splitter. Then you have a spectrometer, and then you obtain, um, as an output intensity, uh, which is proportional to one plus the cosinus of the relative phase that you have between the two arms. You have interferograms of this type, uh, where you have a modulation of the intensity as a function of the wavelengths. The relative phase in this interferometer is given as a function of uh, the wavelengths uh, by uh, the difference between the product of the, the length of the fiber on the test times the, in the refractive index, which depends on lambda, on the wavelengths, uh, minus the, um, the, um, the reference arm, uh, the length of the, of the reference arm. So this is the ideal case scenario. The problem that you have is that you almost work all the time in non-ideal case scenarios, right? So, if you uh, try to go a little bit deeper in the details for the, the dependency of n uh, uh, as a function of the wavelengths, you can see that you have this Taylor expansion for the phase, the relative phase between the two arms, which depends on the length of the, of the fiber on the test, of course the length of the reference arm, but 
You also have all the other, uh, the derivative orders of the uh, refractive index taken at uh, the central wavelengths of your white light source and depending on the resolution of uh, your spectrometer and also of the, the scale that you want to exploit in uh, your measurement. So this is non-ideal and of course uh, it might be the case that because those two first terms, the, 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 um, the zero order and the first order derivative are dominant in this equation, it might be the case that you don't see the interferogram at all. So it means that you have to find what the so-called stationary phase point, where you have to align, to properly align the reference arm here, um, uh, depending on the length of your fiber on the test. And if you reach this particular condition of the stationary phase point, you can retrieve your interferogram, but the problem is that you have a required precision on the alignment of your interferometer, which is on the order for standard white light source of 10 micrometers. And the fact that you will have to realign your interferometer uh, uh, for every single fiber on the test that you want to use. So this is, uh, let's say, a practical problem. So of course it works, and the spectrally resolved white light interferometry finds many applications in absolute distance measurement, in pressure sensors, in profilometry tools for optical fibers or uh, other optical materials, in refractometry, in group delay measurements, or on fiber dispersion measurements. And you can also find more uh, applications for four-wave mixing. As soon as you can characterize your materials very properly, you can find applications in four-wave mixing, supercontinuum generation, telecommunication networks where you have to manage the dispersion, and Raman lasers, uh, among many others. So what about spectrally resolved quantum interferometry, white light quantum interferometry? So this is the standard um, white light classical interferometry that I have been discussed so far. So just for, uh, for, for being totally clear, in this uh, interferometer, what you have is a single photon interference and nothing else. So you have something like a quantum state for, for every single photon that can pose the white light source, you have uh, a decomposition in a, uh, in a coherent superposition of having one photon in the reference arm with no photon in the fiber on the test and, uh, the, and the opposite. And the phase to which this measurement is sensitive is given by phi, which is the relative phase between the two arms. Right? So you can retrieve this interfer interferogram that I have been discussing before. For the uh, uh, white light quantum interferometry, so you need to use a quantum light source. Suppose that you have two photons in your system, and if the two photons are as, uh, travel along either the reference arm or the fiber on the test arm, you will have the same type of state, but this time with two photons, either in the reference or in the fiber on the test arm, and this time you will be submitted, you will, you will be able to exploit a double phase sensitivity since that you have the, the, the factor 2 appearing in the state here. But, because you have this double phase sensitivity, you will have twice as much uh, interference uh, fringes than in the case uh, uh, with single photons. So you have this double phase sensitivity, which is almost, I would say, for free, when you, when you use, for instance, two photon moon states as depicted in this picture. So how to generate moon state? This is what uh, we have been uh, uh, doing uh, so far. So in our experiment, we take a, a, a pump laser, which is uh, at 780 nanometer, uh, where a pump photon can be split into two by dump conversion in a, a, a purely chemical lithium naivate weight guide. And the two photons can be either transmitted, uh, uh, reflected by the bead splitter towards the reference arm, or, sorry, uh, reflected uh, in uh, the fiber on the test, or they can be uh, separated, meaning that you have one photon in the reference arm and the other photon in the fiber on the test. So this uh, should remember you something like, uh, which is called this, the so-called uh, Franzen configuration, where you have here, and uh, please note that it's, it's very important, the uh, interferometer doesn't have to be balanced compared to the single photon case that uh, I have been addressed so far. <coughs> The interferometer here is definitely unbalanced and largely unbalanced on purpose, such that we can have this, this three-peak separation, where you have here the contribution where one photon traveled in the fiber on the test and the other in the reference arm, and the other 
uh, uh, contribution here, con uh, the, the, con the conversely case, the converse case, uh, uh, meaning that the two difference, uh, the two arrival times or coincidence times here are uh, dictated by the, the, the delta L of the interferometer, and in the central peak, you have the two contributions that interfere, uh, meaning that both photons have traveled by the, the, through the reference arm or through the fiber on the test. And here you have access to the quantum phase, I would say, which is um, given by, uh, by, this, by this equation. So the quantum phase is the sum of the phases because you have also energy time entanglement which is created in the PPLN waveguide by spontaneous parametric down conversion. You have uh, the quantum phase, which is the sum of the two phases acquired by the two photons uh, that are at two different wavelengths, lambda 1 and lambda 2. So now, if you, uh, uh, if you have in mind that these two photons that are created inside the waveguides are energy correlated because they are energy time entangled, you have this conservation of energy here, which is written here. 1 over lambda pomp uh, is equal to the sum of the uh, two energies of the two single photons at uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2. It means that you can recompute the Taylor ex expansion for the phase that I have uh, um, uh, written before uh, with this conservation of the energy and you see something totally different where the third order derivative of the refractive index is no longer associated with the delta lambda to the power 3 but to the power 4. Uh, it's very easy to compute the mathematics here, but just believe me for this one. And so far, people have been exploiting have been exploiting noon states uh, and uh, uh, double phase sensitivity in such type of interferometers, but have been have concentrated their efforts on exploiting this part of the equation. In this case, uh, in the case of our work, we have uh, we we are uh, we wanted to exploit this part of the quantum phase in order to have access to the chromatic dispersion of optical fibers. And this is what I will show you now. So the difference between classical and quantum uh, white light interferometry are, are uh, summarized here before I give you the results. So for the, the classical case, you see that you have the third order derivative which is associated with the power tree of the delta lambda. So you, the, these two terms are dominant. So when you have the stationary phase point reached, you can simplify this equation, but you don't change this relationship between the third order derivative of the uh, refractive index and the power tree on delta lambda. So you need to find this stationary phase point within the precision, which is on the order of 10 micrometer for standard white light sources. For the quantum uh, scenario, so you have no stationary phase point to find. The interferometer here is unbalanced in a large manner on purpose because you want to exploit energy time entanglement and the noon state at the same time. So here you can ac have access to a good sensitivity. Here you have access to a double sensitivity just because the f of the fact that you exploit a noon state. Uh, on the third order derivative, as I said, you see that they are not associated with the, 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 the same terms. So the, the fact is that because you have the lambda, uh, the delta lambda to the power 4, this term, compared to the first one, is completely negligible now. So you have, if you have, want to have access to the chromatic dispersion parameter of an optical fiber, you have only one fitting parameters, uh, uh, compared to the case of the classical scenario where you have two free parameters, and this is uh, really a problem uh, for fitting the, 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 the experimental data. And and this uh, classical scenario is prone to uh, uh, stationary phase point artifacts. It may be the case that you align your interferometer, you find an interferogram, but it's not the good one, and such that you can have uh, a measurement on the chromatic dispersion, which is not the absolute one, it's not the good one. And here, essentially, artifacts are impossible, because you have no alignment procedure to, uh, to perform in this case. So let's uh, go to the results and uh, the comparison between the, the classical and quantum results more precisely. So here are the two uh, different cases that we have been test testing in our, uh, in, our, in our team. So we mounted both interferometers and we acquired the data for both scenarios. So here we can find, we, we, we found the stationary phase point for the classical white light uh, experiment. 
and uh, we found uh, a very nice interferogram, as you can see uh, on this picture. Uh, and we would measure a chromatic dispersion value of 17.047 uh, picosecond per nanometer per kilometer at the central wavelength of the white light source, which is 1561 nanometer. For the quantum scenario, we have no stationary phase point to find, but we obtained uh, an interferogram which, um, which uh, has twice as much uh, in, um, in different fringes compared to the classical uh, scenario, and we found a value of 17.035 picosecond per nanometer per kilometer at the same central wavelengths. So, just to, 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 be, to be sure that everything is clear, these two values are different. First of all, these two values are different. And this um, does not correspond to the absolute value of the chromatic, dis of the chromatic dispersion parameter that we have tested in, uh, in, uh, on our, on our uh, experiments. We contacted Corning, uh, who provided us the fiber, and they say that it rather this value, the, the, the value that they measure uh, in, the, in, the, in their company, is rather clo is clo is much closer to this value compared to this one. So this is, <coughs> we, can, we can expect that this is the real value, because we have no artifact due to, this, uh, due to finding the good stationary phase point for this classical scenario. Then we have repeated the measurements a hundred times for each case, for each case, sorry, and you can see the dispersion of the results. The blue curve represents the standard, uh, the standard uh, experiment, classical experiment, and the red one uh, corresponds to the quantum scenario. So here we have uh, uh, an uncertainty on the values that we have found of 0 0.051 picosecond nanometer per, nanometer per kilometer, and in this case. Uh, we have 0 0.021, which corresponds to a, a 2.6 uh, improvement factor uh, between the two situations. So just two things that have to be mentioned. Um, in the quantum case, we exploit 60, less, uh, 60 times less photons uh, for the full measurements compared to the classical scenario, and we can reach an absolute value of the chromatic dispersion and a better factor of precision on the measurement because we combine, in this case, conceptual and experimental advantages that I can uh, summarize <coughs> here in the discussion. So, in the summary, so we have this uh, spectrally resolved white light quantum interferometry setup, which is mounted and uh, fully operational. So we obtain a double phase sensitivity, as you could see. We have simplified and faster procedures, no stationary phase point to be found. We have only one fitting parameter, we have a 2.6 times improved accuracy compared to the classical interferometry scenario, and despite we exploit 60 times less photons uh, in the system. So you can see uh, um, um, all the results and the details of the experiment on the archive, and the number of the paper is uh, is this one. So. The, my, my takeaway message would be the following. Quantum <coughs> offers more than just a two-fold phase sensitivity, provided you use two-photon noon state, but you have clever experimental arrangements as well. So to go further, we can also, of course, make uh, technical improvements, uh, tune the wavelengths to have uh, access to the dispersion slope, which is of very interest for uh, fiber optical companies, for manufacturers, I would say. We could also use true, uh, true uh, two-photon noon state to augment the measurement speed. For instance, a type two waveguide uh, could help uh, in, this, uh, in this perspective. Also, we could use higher photon number uh, noon states. And also, we could improve uh, the spectrometer and the detectors, uh, notably an array of detectors for single shot acquisition instead of repeating the measurement all the time. And uh, we are now uh, currently thinking of building two prototypes, uh, one for chromatic dispersion measurements for optical fibers and optical materials at uh, 532 nanometer, from 532 nanometer to uh, 1600 nanometers. And also we uh, would like to uh, um, transfer our knowledge that we have now on, uh, refract on direct refractive index measurement as well. Uh, before I end, uh, I would like to uh, inform you that at the Institute of Physics in Nice, we have uh, positions that are available. So the thematics of the of the Infini are quantum photonics, integrated nonlinear optics, fiber optics, cold atoms, complex systems, and so on and so on. 
So we are uh, looking for a permanent professorship position, and this is very urgent. So if you are interested, please send us uh, or send me CVs and application letters. We are also finding two PhD uh, uh, candidates. Then this is also urgent, and one postdoc. Um, the, the, the two PhDs and the postdoc are for my team, and the professor will be for the infini uh, in itself. So now it's time to, for me to show you a picture of the team. So first of all, in the swimming pool. So we also have uh, good recreation times in this. Uh, the weather is always nice, so we can have uh, these, uh, very uh, nice recreation times. Or in the garden of the, of the institute. And I thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to open the question now to the floor. So the panelists do well use uh, a new state uh, and the photons are also energy entangled. Exactly. How does your, sorry, how does your uh, error defense on the coherence time of your pump? Uh, because I guess that if the pump gets shorter and shorter... No, yeah, you, you, you're, you're correct. I didn't discuss this, this uh, point in detail, but I can show you the slide, it would be better. Yeah. What you don't want, uh, you, you want two things. First of all, you, you want to have a quantum-like source that provides you with a very broad spectrum, such that we have engineered the phase matching of this PPLN waveguide with a little chirp on this, uh, to have access to uh, almost 100 nanometers of, uh, of uh, broadband spectrum. But what you don't want, for sure, is that your central wavelengths of the, the two emitted photons move or shift a little bit over the measurement time. <coughs> such that this laser has been uh, 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 frequency stabilized against a rubidium transition, um, like uh, people from cold atom do uh, uh, every day. So this laser is uh, very, very stable, such that the, 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 the waveguide is uh, maintained in an oven at uh, 90 degrees or something like this to avoid uh, any uh, photoreflective effect, but down to 10 millikelvin stabilization. So this part of the setup doesn't move at all in frequency. Any but this is a very good question. Any more questions? Um, so one of the things that you showed was one of the things that you showed was that the two methods give slightly different results, yeah. and you think that the quantum result has a lower systematic error. Yeah. Um, can, can you say something about uh, how, in general, one would distinguish between these, these two situations and, and to estimate the systematic errors in a measurement like this? Well, this is a very good question. And there is no, uh, at least to my knowledge at the moment, uh, uh, a very clear methodology to assess that the quantum result is absolute and that the classical results are not. What I can do, what I can tell you, is that we have repeated these measurements a hundred, more than a hundred times uh, over uh, several weeks. And with the quantum method, we always, always found the same result. With the classical system, we never found the same result. If, okay, it's not a very uh, precise way of indicating that the quantum result is for sure absolute, but with the classical system, the classical interferometer, you leave it for the night, you come back tomorrow morning and to, to re-perform the experiment, you have to, ref to, to find again your st stationary phase point. It might be the case that you are on an artifact and you cannot know. You, you can never discriminate between the good phase st uh, stationary phase point or uh, if you are just a little bit shifted by uh, uh, some jaggers. And that's totally insane. With the quantum method, you can never, never, never go in trouble with that. Okay, any more questions? Hi, uh, I'll try to be very brief. So, uh, how does it scale with the length of the device in the test? So, your fiber, I guess, is, you know. So, for the classical system, it scales. The, uh, <laughs> it's a very good question, actually. Uh, let, let me let me let me show you the difference. It will be probably much clearer on this slide. So you see that for this classical system, 
the way that you have to align your interferometer it's not the fact that it highly depends, but it dramatically depends on the length of your fiber because you have to adapt your reference arm uh, towards reaching this uh, so-called uh, stationary phase point, right? So if you use a one meter long fiber or a 10 kilometer long fiber, it's not the same problem that you have. So this method, of course, applies better for short uh, fibers and short uh, optical materials because uh, it's very difficult to have a reference arm of one kilometer, even in a, even in a company, in a lab for sure. But here, you don't care about that at all, because what you want to, what you want to have is just, um, sorry, I will find it, it's here. What you want to find is this condition where, for, for, for such system, it would not be the case if you have a true, fo a true to photon non state, but for our case, <coughs> You just want to have a clear separation between the three contrib contributions to the, uh, that you acquire with your coincidence electronics. So one photon is detected in this APD here, and the other photon has been subjected to the spectrometer and uh, collected in a fiber and then detected by another a APD, and you have a coincidence electronics between the two APDs, which I didn't discuss uh, earlier. But, so if you have a one meter long fiber, which was, which was uh, our case, you are, you are okay. You don't need to have a, a one kilometer fiber here because your interferometer has to be unbalanced. And the more unbalanced it is, the more you separate the three uh, peak contributions. We also tested this system with uh, uh, less than one centimeter fibers, or no, two or three centimeters, sorry, and it worked pretty, pretty good as well. We didn't test uh, one kilometer, but we can do it uh, because the, 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 this is not a big deal. Okay, so I think we have to move on, but let's thank Sebastian again.